Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the Global Compliance Panel, and welcome to our live webinar on uh, risk analysis in pharmaceutical manufacturing, a regulatory overview. I'm David, your host for today, and on behalf of our team, I would like to say thank you for being part of this event. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to inform that if you get logged out of the training session for some reason, I request you to follow the same procedure to join in again. Our presenter today is Dr. Kohara. Originally from Hawaii, Dr. Kuara holds a degree, a degrees in biochemistry from Cornell and the University of Wisconsin, uh, starting as an assistant professor of chemistry at the California State University, Long Beach. He began his industrial career in the division of biologic products at the Michigan Department of Public Health and now Bioport Corporation, where he became the head of quality control. His last position was as director of quality control and asset development with a virtual company. He's currently the head of his company, GXP Biotechnology, LLC. And Dr. Kuhara is an experienced analytical biochemist who has applied his academic knowledge to quality control in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, he, uh, his work has also dealt with all aspects of GMP and GLP in relation to biopharmaceuticals. Uh, Dr. Kuhara has written several papers and book chapters and serves on the editorial advisory boards of Biopharm, Bioquality, and the Journal of GXP Compliance. He has held certifications as a CQA, CQT, and CQE for the American Society of Quality and was certified RAC by the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. Uh, we're really honored to have someone as distinguished uh, as Dr. Kuara with us to present this webinar. Now, before we begin, I would like to inform uh, the program outline for this webinar. The session is for 75 minutes duration. First, Dr. Kuara will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. Um, now that we all ready to start a request to Dr. Kawara. Take it from here. Steve? Okay. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm sorry I had problems with my microphone and, well, my computer headset, and we started late as a result, but I hope we can, well, make up the time. We do have some time at the end. So this is a large topic. And uh, one of the problems here, of course, is that uh, we we need to well, I guess we we need to um, discuss this thing a little bit slowly because there are many facets to it that uh, we're going to pass over fairly quickly. And I will warn you that um, well, down the line you really do need to get more training. And um, we actually expect you to be sort of unsatisfied and want more training because this is just an overview. Now, for those of you who are pharmaceutical manufacturers as opposed to device manufacturers, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers mainly need to be concerned with Annex 20 of the EU GMPs, and I'll give you the ref reference to this, and also ICHQ9, which covers quality mis risk management. Now, for those of you with early products, um, ICHQ8 covers what they want to see as risk management during the early stages of product development. For the device people, your main document is ISO 14971, the 2007 edition of this, uh, covers a lot of the um, medical devices end of the, the subject. Now, for the pharma people, like I said, there's ICHQ9 up here for quality risk management. And for the, develop, for the developers of new products, you need to look, take a look at ICHQ8, uh, Revision 2, which recently came out. The reference for the European um, GMPs is Utrelex, and it's the volume four of rules governing medicinal products in the EU, and volume four covers GMP for the EU, and it's Annex 20 to Volume 4 that you want to take a look at. Uh, it covers quality risk management. Now, I will tell you ahead of time that Annex 20 and ICHQ9 have similarities. So um, the main thing is, is that
said, if you're going to submit to the EU, you need to take a look at Annex 20 just to make sure that um, you know you've covered everything. If you if you've been following Q9 to begin with. Now, question comes up, you know, where did this risk management business come from, and why risk management and all this? Now, about 45 percent of the recalls, uh, so far in a way, of drugs and devices relate to design problems. And many of these design problems uh, are problems because they create risks. Now, many risks are really, I've been through, you know, product development sessions where risks are brought up and then they're ignored, um, usually on orders of a higher manager, mainly because, um, they, they take this attitude of, well, we're developing a product, uh, we're in early stages, it's not good to have negative thoughts about the product, uh, you got to think positively, don't bring up possible problems and all this. Uh, to me, this is extremely foolish, but uh, you need to watch out for this. Now, there's a couple of things here. You know, one of the reasons people will often say, well, you can ignore it because it's not going to be a problem uh, because the operator or the user would, you know, will follow directions and therefore it's not a problem. Well, the fact is, is that the more you rely on the user or the operator to follow directions, um, the chance of problems is fairly high because, you know, users are never 100% effective. And uh, even the robots will have breakdowns or software glitches. So even if you have a mechanical or robotic system running, you cannot assume that it's going to be 100% effective. Similarly, you can, must, must not assume that patients will follow directions. Um, this is, you know, it's fairly common. No matter what it, what you say in the direction insert or on the label, uh, you're going to find people that will not follow the directions, either because they forget or because they don't care. Or in some cases, they don't even bother reading your directions. And, you know, this is very similar. You have a label that says, do not take with alcoholic beverages. Well, somebody gets drunk and they go ahead and take it anyway. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing happens. Now, what do the regulators expect? Now, this is the thing. For the device people, it's pretty good. There are clear requirements for risk analysis, but for drugs, um, FDA has brought in this thing recently. Um, they expect you to have design control, and this is at early stages or with a new product. But even for old products, they'd like you to go back and take a look at the design of the product and what you're doing, your development plan. And this should include a risk management plan. And I will tell you right now, even if you have an old product, you still want to go back and do a risk management on this thing. Now, you need to think about the risks not only from your manufacturing, but also from the patient's point of view. You know, there are some things that are uh, manufacturing risks in the sense that it represents a loss of money to your company. And... Um, or, well, in addition to the loss of money, uh, there could be potential risk in the sense of um, manufacturer or manufacturing personnel injury. So these things need to be considered. And right now, to obtain a license from FDA, you need to show that you've considered the risk. Now, they are sort of ramping up in terms of how stringent they want your study to be or how carefully they expect you to investigate risks. Um, with all established products, they're kind of letting things go for now, but they are starting to bring in more requirements, especially
especially for new products. And uh, they will move on to established products as time goes by. Now, the other place you need to consider risk is what, you know, when you're performing a validation and also when you're dealing with OOS situations. The, um, you know, one of the questions that comes up a lot of times is how risky is the OOS? If the OOS is true, uh, what's the danger to the patient? On the other hand, if the OOS is true, well, maybe there's a minor risk to the patient. So you need to make those evaluations while you're doing your OOS investigation. Now, what kind of risks are you worried about? And basically, you're, you have to consider not only just normal use and, um, you know, use as, as you um, explain it in terms of your direction insert and things like that, uh, instructions that you give to physicians, but also with misuse of the product. And the thing is, is that you do need to consider the possibility of deliberate misuse or, um, you know, criminal use of your product. I mean, especially those of you who are making narcotics and things like that. Now, also, when you're performing your validations, you need to consider the risk associated with a particular step, especially if that step should fail. And, you know, this should be done early on when you're developing your process or method validation plan because the risk analysis tells you what needs to be especially emphasized in the validation study. And in an OOS uh, situation, you must consider the risk uh, associated with the failure, if it is true. Now, the, the whole point here is to prevent you from just minimizing things and blowing them off. You must think about this thing. And also, you know, you have uh, situations, you have risks that have low probabilities but there, are, there can be severe consequences in more than one way. And, um, you know, <laughs> right now we're dealing with the, the classical one of British Petroleum and the, um, the oil rig in the, Gulf State, in the Gulf that collapsed and has started and has been spewing oil. Now, if you had talked to British Petroleum a long time ago, they would have told you that the chances of an oil rig falling over and blowing up uh, were very small. But nonetheless, the consequences are very severe. So they should have thought about what they were dealing with here and the potential for this thing happening. Now, in risk management, the definition is that it's a systemic a systematic application of management practices to analysis, evaluation, control, and reassessment of the risk, periodic reassessment. You use risk-benefit analysis or cost-benefit analysis to the consideration of the risk. Now, I'll say, I'll say more about cost-benefit analysis um, as we go along here, but just remember, bad publicity can be very expensive, even though the risk itself may have been relatively minor. And, in, you know, consider the situation with Toyota, where I'm pretty sure they probably realized that there was a prob probability, a small probability of their software having a glitch in it. And they tested it, and they probably figured that, well, you know, uh, there, the possibility, potential for these things happening is very small. But the problem is, is that somebody like Toyota makes a lot of product. And the old rule in the pharmaceutical industry is that, you know, the more product you make, sooner or later you run into the one patient who reacts badly to that product. And the same thing happened to Toyota. I mean, it, the actual risk of this um, pedal problem or the southern acceleration